Welcome to Inspirational Leadership. I'm your host, Kristen Harcourt, and we have another amazing, fabulous guest. Today, we are speaking with Dorsey Standish, who is a mechanical engineer, neuroscientist, and wellness expert who brings evidence-based mindfulness and emotional intelligence to clients worldwide through her company, Mastermind. Her personal mission is to help type A people like herself slow down, de-stress, and optimize their performance through research-based brain health training. A lifelong learner, Dorsey holds a master's degree in cognitive neuroscience from University of Texas at Dallas and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. Dorsey's teachings draw on her training as a teacher of mindfulness-based stress reduction through Brown University and deep experience on regular seven-day silent meditation retreats studying with master teachers. Welcome to the show, Dorsey. Thanks so much, Kristen. So glad to be here. Uh, So anyone who has been following the podcast for a while knows that everything that Dorsey is talking about today are the topics that I'm incredibly passionate about when it comes to meditation and mindfulness and emotional intelligence. And many times I share some of my story because I can relate to the uh, type A personality. Everyone would love to learn more about you, Dorsey, and your story and what brought you to this work, because I I think you have a a unique story and um, I'd love for everyone to get a chance to hear more about it. Yeah, definitely, Kristen. Um, I have to say, I sometimes have to pinch myself and be like, oh my gosh, you meditate on a daily basis and you teach other people how to meditate because I was pulled kicking and screaming into the meditation and wellness world, honestly. As I look back at my life, it's some of the biggest challenges um, and pain points that I've been through that have actually pivoted me towards my healing journey. And um, meditation is no different. I identify definitely as type A. I'm the daughter of two lawyers. Um, I always prioritized academics. If you look back at my first grade journal, I say, I'm in Mrs. Palmer's first grade. I wish we had more homework. (laughs) I was always wanting to do things, literally to check boxes, even in first grade. So you can imagine as I continued on into, you know, mechanical engineering at Penn and started my career at Texas Instruments, I'm bringing that same box checking, you know, let's go do things personality to design, to program management. And it wasn't until I burned out that I let, work and how things looked like on the outside and traveling internationally for, for business, get in the way of my sleep, my mental health, the things that I've now learned I have to do to take care of myself, um, that I experience that burnout, that mental health crisis that forced me to take several months off of work to recover. And when you take work away from a type A person whose identity is all work, it creates this vacuum that's like left me just really in one of my lowest points ever for several weeks. And it, at some point I had this, um, this shift where I started to realize that even if I went back to work in the same job or found a different job or worked at a different company, no matter where I went in my life and my work, I knew that I wasn't going to be stress-free, that I wanted to make an impact. I'm a high performer. And so I knew stuff like this would come up again. I'd have to travel or I'd have a big project due. And so I decided to start researching stress resilience and how I could learn to bounce back rather than being so weighed upon by the inevitable stressors of life. And so I was doing that research, um, you know, I'm like looking for something to add to my box checking list. And what keeps coming up is meditation. (laughs) I'm like, no, you've got to be kidding. Like there has to be something else, something that I can do that involves forward motion. Um, But no, it's non-doing. So I was desperate enough, thank goodness, that I committed to, um, for the month of May in 2015, to doing two minutes of mindfulness every day. I still have a screenshot from the Calm app that shows my check boxes. So I did get to check some boxes of doing that practice every day. And that was like the very start of forming this snowball that's been rolling ever since in terms of, it was so positive for me to just take a few minutes for myself in the morning and get centered and connected with what I wanted before worrying about what the world wanted for me. I noticed even when I went back to work and kept up that practice that I was able to be more focused, less reactive at work. 
And I had more energy because I had started the day by giving something to myself before giving everything else away. And so that that snowball effect and journey has continued and taken me to um, things like silent meditation retreats, which you mentioned, um, to going back to school to get a master's in neuroscience to understand how is this helping my mental health so much? This is amazing. Um, to you know, investigating how mindfulness can help with things like sleep. Um, you know, I'm a re I'm a new mom ish. My it'll be almost two in January, so it's like I went through this whole journey of how can mindfulness help me rest and take deeper naps, right? Or nutrition has been a big thing. So, um, what I've found through my own healing journey and what really resonates with a lot of my type A corporate clients is using mindful awareness and a basic understanding of my brain. How can I take those two things and apply them to any type of challenge that arises in my work or my life and continually be moving towards healing and towards the recognition that health really begins in the brain. It doesn't begin, I believe, with what we look like. It begins with our nervous system and how well we're regulating that and how in touch we are with ourselves. Mm. So good. And I, I really appreciate you sharing that resistance because I've, I've seen that experience with a lot of leaders to a, a resistance. And I think part of the resistance, and I want to talk to you more about this in our conversation is perhaps myths around what meditation is and what it isn't and uh, mindfulness as well, I'd say. Um, similar to you in terms of, I, I heard people talking about it all the time. I'm like, oh, not for me, not for me. My mind doesn't shut off. And then when my daughter was born almost 15 years ago, um, I just started to notice that it was, I was way too reactive. I was feeling overwhelmed with all the different feelings. So I just thought, okay, what's the worst thing that could happen? And then, you know, almost 15 years now, haven't looked back. But again, I think there is a, perhaps a misconception that holds some people back from getting some exposure to, to meditation and mindfulness. So let's start with that. Like when you think about from the meditation perspective, because I know you're out there educating, you're teaching, helping people understand exactly what this is. And I love that there's all the science to support it as well. But what do you think are some of the myths that might hold people back from getting more exposure and practicing meditation? Yeah, Kristen. So when I when I first started meditating um, that summer of 2015, I remember coming home to visit my parents who still live in the D.C. area. And so it was a special it was a reunion. They're happy to see me. And I walk up to the door and my dad, you know, swings open the front door and goes, hi, Dorsey. Or should I say namaste? <laughs> Since you're a meditator now and like, you know. <laughs> he's, you know, a type A lawyer. And it's, you know, even in 2024, that was 10 years ago, but still today, when we say the word meditation, or we say the word mindfulness, people have these associations with it. And of course, the practice of learning to uh, cope with the fluctuations of our mind has been around for thousands of years. But when we think about mindfulness in its truest sense, there's actually no Sanskrit word, no namaste that needs to be incorporated with it. It doesn't actually have to do with yoga, although sometimes it can. You don't have to be Buddhist. You don't have to be calm. You don't have to sit cross-legged. It's actually a way of paying attention. So when we practice mindfulness, we're paying attention to the present moment with flexibility, with kindness, and with curiosity. And you've mentioned your kiddos, and I've mentioned mine. It's almost like less like we have to learn something new and more like we have to remember the way that we used to pay attention when we would just take hours, you know, playing by the stream and touching the water and the rocks and being curious and having that sense of wonder and awe and engagement in the present moment. That's mindfulness. And oftentimes our, our habitual uh, doing mind, our, our stress response, all those things can get in the way of that kind, curious, open way of paying attention that is what we train in, in mindfulness practice. Most of the, you know, even my dad, I'll tell you this. So um, he and I talked more about meditation on that trip and going forward. And I would always, for the longest time, I tried to get my parents to meditate with me. It took them over five years <laughs> before they even <laughs> came to a class and considered it. But when I talked to my dad more about how he managed stress as a, a lawyer, 
he said, you know, I, I like, I love to garden and listen to instrumental music. It's like, dad, that's mindfulness. Your hands are in the dirt. You're listening to calming music. Like most of the high performers that I talk to, they already have their own ways of practicing mindfulness. Maybe they associate it with work. Maybe it's like that, that single pointed focus on a project or being with a client and being fully there with them. Maybe it's when they're playing with their kids at the end of the day and they really put work aside to just read a book together. Or maybe they have a tradition of running or taking long showers. You know, everybody's different, but I find that once you help people understand that mindfulness is just a way of paying attention and you can practice mindfulness meditation, which is a, a formal form of brain training. But once we level set on that definition, people start to be open to it and see themselves as potentially someone who could practice mindfulness. Yeah, that's been my experience um, a, a lot of times with clients. Sometimes they start to actually have more self-compassion and grace and kindness with themselves to actually realize they've been doing a lot of really great things from a coping strategy perspective. They hadn't really labeled it like that. And I think so often, um, doing the meditation is training your brain so that then when you're in your day to day, you become better at being the observer, because I think there's a fallacy for some people. Oh, for me to be a really good meditator, which type a is like, Oh, I need my gold stars in meditation to be the best meditator out there is some somehow that you sit there and that your mind never wanders and it's just quiet the whole time. When I say to everyone, I'm like, no, 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 no one's I I've been doing this forever. There's many times, but I'm just noticing. And I'm bringing for me, it tends to be, I, I use the breath as an anchor or sometimes a mantra as an anchor different ways for everyone, but it's just bringing it back, bringing it back and just noticing, oh my gosh, look at this monkey mind. Like it's very active and it's very all over the place and, but observing it in a kind way and, and noticing it. Um, I, I don't know if that's been your experience, but a lot of people who I've spoken to have this mis misperception that they're supposed to just have no wandering and that their mind is just totally silent or they're not doing it right. Yes, I'm so glad. That's the second biggest misconception. After like, well, it's not for me. Like I, I already am not in that. Once they try it once or a few times, they'll tell me things like you just said, well, I, I can't clear my mind or I'm not doing it right. What's right and what's wrong? And there's this misconception that if I'm having racing thoughts or my mind is busy, then that's wrong. And then right is feeling calm and like looking like those stock photos <laughs> of meditation, right? Where it's like, oh, I just love being here. Um, so yes, I 100% agree with you that part of the shift that I made when I started the practice is I gave myself permission, you know, as a type A competitive person, there's so many things in my life that I try to be good at meditation's not one of them. I'm not good at meditation. Even 10 years of having a daily practice, I would not say I'm a good meditator one, cause that doesn't really exist, but even so like I'm regularly distracted by thoughts, emotions, sounds around me. That's, that's part of the practice. Um, what we know from neuroscience, from actually brain scans of people in meditation is that there are distinctive stages of the practice. So there's the focus part, which you're mentioning, where people choose with mindfulness meditation to be anchored on the breath or a body scan or their sense of hearing, for example. And then you can actually see when their neural patterns shift to mind wandering and they get distracted and they go away. And then you can actually see the moment when they realize they're distracted. It activates the salience networks of like, oh, I'm aware. Whoops, I got distracted. And then there's this shift, this magic, like I call it the bicep curl for the mind. Every time we notice we're distracted and we come back to our anchor, that's where the neural changes happen. That's actually when we're activating those executive networks that strengthen those pathways for our daily lives. So one of the shifts that I have made for myself and I share with my type A clients is that the more you're distracted, the, the more opportunities you have to build that mental muscle of coming back, which is what it's all about. So they tend to love that reframe of failure into opportunity and even... It sounds like that, that resonates with you as well. You mentioned that shift. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. Well, because I think it's also it, it gets them instead of them feeling like they're not doing it right or they have to get this perfection thing. It's like, oh, it's great that it's distracted and that you're observing and noticing that's distracted and you're bringing it back. That's you doing a really good job of doing the training like you're building that muscle. I think that's such an important reframe because it's um, there. There's this belief that somehow they're they're that It's just a waste of time. They almost, I think sometimes try it and then say, you know what, I'm not doing it right. So I'm just, it's a waste of time and I'm not going to do this anymore. And hopefully for anybody's listening, who's feeling curious, this might be an invitation knowing it looks different. I'm curious also from your perspective, Dorsey, I've noticed that it's not necessarily about how long I'm meditating, but more about consistency. And if I'm doing it every day, it just feels like I just notice how I feel in my day. I feel more relaxed. I feel more calm. I feel less reactive. I actually feel more joy and just connected to myself and others. And it's more, I'm more in the present moment. Um, what are your thoughts around how long, how often, all of that kind of stuff? Yeah, great questions, Kristen. So I love the, um, for type A folks, the quote from John Kabat-Zinn, who says the only goal of meditation is to become more of who you really are. So you can think like when you're sitting down, whether it's for a minute or 20 minutes, it's like, I'm just becoming myself. I'm just sitting with any thoughts, any emotions that are here. And um, sometimes it's those moments where we don't feel like meditating and we don't feel good. That can be so important to take that mindful moment. And um, you asked specifically about recommendations for, for time. And I always say to start so small, you can't make an excuse about it. So I started with two minutes um, in today's world. I'd even say 30 to 60 seconds. We know that the brain is, is just like a muscle and it makes a difference when you park further away from the store or you take the stairs, maybe not instantaneous. You don't get like huge calf muscles from walking <laughs> up the stairs once you're not perfectly calm from a minute of meditation, but those little actions build up and make a difference. And so for me and my clients, the first focus is getting a consistent habit of at least a minute. I call them mindful minutes, at least one mindful minute a day. And from there, once you have the habit built, it's really easy to expand it, but we want to make it like brushing your teeth so that it's something I think about, like, I don't leave the house in the morning, right? Until I've meditated. That's just kind of a, a, a personal rule. So yeah. things like starting small um, habit bundling. So I have clients that already engage in things like prayer or making their kids breakfast or taking their dog on a walk. All of these habits that we have can actually, we can bundle this new habit with those and take the dog for a walk without our phone and, and notice the surroundings, have a mindful walk or sit down with our kids and take a few breaths before they eat breakfast. Um, just this idea of building in kind of engineering, if you will, your mindful minute into something bigger that you already do every day helps make it stickier. Yeah. And then from there, exploring resources, if you're into, you know, science, or you want to listen to podcasts like this one, like finding some continued inspiration, whether that's, you know, information, whether that's other people like-minded on your journey with you, whether that's going to a retreat or some kind of workshop, so that you feel like you have that inspiration and motivation to keep going and stick with it. I'd say for at least a month, like commit to that and then see how you feel afterwards before you make a decision one way or another. Yeah, I think that's great. I talk a lot with clients. I, I really love the book um, Atomic Habits by James Clear and how he talks about the habit stacking. And so you're, if you're already having your tea, perfect time to do it then. If you're going for your walk, figuring out what your rituals already look like. So then it's just something that's adding and, and making it even better in terms of what you're already doing. So when you start to think about from a neuroscience perspective, so you were, you were doing this, you're seeing all the results, and then you got even more excited and said, I need to do a master's in neuroscience and understand this even more, which I've always been fascinated with the neuroplasticity and where we used to think that, okay, it's already all established how you can create new neural pathways and all of that kind of stuff, which is incredible. Um, when you started to get more exposure, exposure to neuroscience, what's inspired you? What got excited? What did you start to learn about? 
Yeah, Kristen, you know, what's so interesting is, is I'm listening to you talk and hearing about what your clients say, what my clients say, um, just bringing it back to things like Atomic Habits, which is such a great book and resource. At the end of the day, the conversations, the books, what, what they're doing and what the neuroscience masters did for me is it, it gave me a better understanding of my own brain and nervous system. It took something that felt like a black box and helped to put it into discrete parts or networks and bring that same sense of, you know, gentle, mindful, kind curiosity to myself and really rectify that self-understanding with a neural understanding of how our brains are wired as human beings. So the coolest thing for me has been understanding that when I um, get this tingly sensation on my scalp and my heart rate increases when my teenager won't get off his computer, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's almost like that's my amygdala trying to hijack the rational parts of my brain. Like that's my autonomic nervous system coming in to start that fight or flight response. And I can even feel that and imagine that. And then because I have that understanding of you're not a bad mom, you're not a bad person, everyone loses their temper, it's part of being human, then I can start to make intentional choices and pause and say, okay, how do I want to respond in this situation versus react? And I'm not perfect, but for me, taking off the, the shame, the blame that it's only me and moving that towards a view of common humanity of... This is how our brains are wired. Okay, I have this book on my desk, which isn't planned, but it's called Why Buddhism is True by Robert Wright. Yes. And it's all about evolutionary psychology. And one of the things he says is that our brains didn't evolve to be happy. <laughs> they evolved to stay alive and get our genes into the next generation. I mean, when you think about it, our negativity bias, um, the way we're so quick to anger or react to protect ourselves and keep ourselves safe, the way our brain keeps alerting us to stress or challenge. So we can't focus on anything when we're anxious because our brain goes, but what about that? But what about that? But what about that? So all of those um, understandings, they're only as useful, like studying the brain to me is only as useful as I can map that to my personal experience, the experiences of my clients and shed some understanding, common humanity, and maybe some relatable stories <laughs> to help give us all some, some visibility into what, what could be just a black box of our brains. Yeah, I think it's so important because I think there is a lot of this, whether it's shared out, out with others or just kept to themselves, where people are feeling a sense of shame or that they're failures, that, that they're not showing up that the way that they want to show up. And I think the more that we acknowledge our humanity and that we're all alike and we're all going through, it's not like somebody is over here and not having, even people who are enlightened will say, I still have these thoughts that come through and I'm so, so it's not that you get to this place, but I think when you start to understand a little bit more around what's operating in the backgrounds that you can have some more compassion for yourself with. Of course, that's why this is happening. You're trying to keep yourself alive. These are survival biological instincts. It's good that they kept you alive. It's just, there's ways that it's not serving you anymore. And here's how you can start to work with that, which I think connects nicely to the emotional intelligence piece, which you and I um, love this and do a lot of work with organizations when it comes to emotional intelligence. So if we start to connect this back to, we can look at it from either the individual level or the organizational level. What do you see as some of the challenges that are happening on the individual or organizational level when it comes to emotional intelligence? Yeah, you know, it, it ties in with some of the, obviously we know, right, that, that mindfulness is correlated with emotional intelligence. So people that have greater mindfulness are going to have higher EQs. And one of our biggest focuses in our programming at Mastermind is reducing stress and overwhelm. That's the biggest thing we see across the board. I actually had a call earlier today with some clients to plan our 2025 wellness programming. And they're like passing it off to each other. Like, well, I don't have time to plan this meditation. And there's only so much I can do to be like, look at the irony of this. Like we're too busy and we want people to come to this meditation. Right. So I just see continually that people live in this state of overwhelm that impacts their ability to pause and know their own emotions and regulate them. 
and also changes the way they interact with others. So they come from a place of autopilot, of reacting rather than responding because they're so stressed. They don't have time to write a nicer email or pick up the phone. Everything is so transactional that again, relationships, social connection is pushed to the side. And if you think back to how we've evolved, social connection is a huge pillar of mental health and well-being. There's a reason that the Surgeon General says we have a loneliness epidemic in the United States where I am, right? It's because we're we're moving towards this, this world that's transactional, that's box checking, which believe me, I can relate to. That's my how my brain is wired. But we miss what I think is so wonderful about teachings around mindfulness and emotional intelligence is they remind us of what it is to be human. We all have the ability to be present. We all have emotions that as much as we'd like to think we're logical creatures, the emotional brain came first. We are run by emotions. We make decisions based on emotions. We choose our relationships based on emotions. I mean, even if you look at world events like the election or you look at advertising, right? Everything that that people are trying to motivate us to action by, it's all based on emotions. And so if we can can pause and get curious and learn a little bit about things like EQ and mindfulness, it, it taps us into this whole world within ourselves. And then also with the people we love, the people we work with, if we can just take that time to get curious, I, I can't tell you the personal impact that it's had on you know, everything from my wife to my my teenager, um, to my little one, to myself, to my clients. I've had so many experiences myself and then watching others of when they kind of open their minds to the power of EQ, they see that it doesn't just impact their work. It's like, oh, I'm getting along with my girlfriend better, I've heard, or oh, my anxiety is actually not as bad after I do a 10 minute meditation. <laughs> it's like, you can tell people that all day long, but until they do it themselves and teach each other and set that example within the workplace, it's really challenging. So that's why we're moving at Mastermind in this hybrid work, work world that a lot of us live in back to doing hybrid or in-person team buildings, trainings, so that we're starting to move the needle on creating a shared vocabulary and a, a culture of mindfulness and emotional intelligence and a, a focus on social connection that we've seen to be really powerful in, in helping both the success and the cohesion of the teams that we work with. Yeah, it's so it's so powerful and transformational. I think a couple of things with what I just heard you say there. One is I think it's beautiful that when you transform, of course, you're not when you transform, it doesn't just impact how you show up in your workplace, it impacts how you show up in all relationships. So in your communities and your families. Uh, and then we're also very relational creatures. And so we're constantly interacting. When I think about so often in coaching where the challenges come from, it's almost always about another human. You know, mm -hmm. once in a while, it's the stress piece and around, but even the stress is usually again, connected to another human, right? It's like, this is creating me stress because X, Y, Z. Sometimes it might be about um, holding boundaries and that's more of their own personal accountability. But a lot of times it's the relational stuff and it's incredibly powerful as people become more mindful, as they slow down, as they're able to pause so that they can respond to a situation instead of react. And as their nervous system is regulated, one of the things that I find so beautiful is that they start to connect more deeply with the humans around them because they're able to listen, to have that act of listening and be present and listen in a much different way. And then of course, I always say this, it's like, if you think people can't tell when you're having a conversation and you're thinking about something else at the same time, don't be, they can, they can tell whether you're present or not. People think they're like, oh, they don't know that. Like I'm thinking about something else in my head as I'm having that dialogue. Yes, they can. They can, we can feel the energy of that presence. And then it's so beautiful because as you're present like that, not only are you listening and active listening and be, which is such a gift to the human in front of you, but when you're actually active listening, you hear things that you might've not heard before, which then allows you to be able to communicate more effectively as well. Yes. It's, it's kind of like a superpower, right? I mean, I know that's how you teach it is like, Hey, <laughs> this is yes, really awesome. yes. It becomes a superpower. Um, the other thing I was thinking about as you were talking about the EQ and it reminded me is, um, I've had some clients who were a little bit skeptical around the meditation, but when we made it a challenge, cause they like challenges yes. and <laughs> that comes around it. And I said, okay, 
let's just make it 30 days, like just commit to 30 days every day for 30 days. And then at the end of the 30 days, if you find that was a total waste of time, you got nothing out of that, then that's good. Like you gave it a try. And every time I've done that with clients, many, many clients, nobody has gone to the end of the 30 days and said that was such a waste of time. They've said, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I committed to that 30 days so that I could actually experience what this is all about and see the byproduct and how it's already so quickly after 30 days having such a big impact. I love that, Kristen. I love the the idea of the challenge. I find that that works really well too. And that, you know, even if it's so funny, people think there's a wrong or right way to meditate, but even if you just like lay on your couch and daydream for 10 minutes. I mean, we just, we're, we're craving space in, in our society. I don't know if you've read any of Cal Newport's books, his digital minimalism book. He talks about we're suffering from solitude deprivation, that we always are listening to a podcast or talking to someone or looking at an email and we're never just alone. So even if it's not meditation, I'm not pretending that it has to be for everybody, but what would it look like to give yourself some space to look out the window or to be with your, your thoughts or your emotions? Because I think part of this, you know, it's really easy for me to sit here and tell people to pay attention with curiosity and kindness. And sometimes it is, but sometimes when we're going through stress or, um, tra- past traumatic events are being triggered or things are difficult, like we underestimate how much courage it takes in today's world to pause and be with what's here, especially when it's not pleasant. Like I, I've had executives come up to me after sessions and be like, oh, like all these emotions came up. I cried during your session. Like I just try to push those down. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. that's not healthy, you know, which we know, but it yeah. just, it's, you know, it's not just mindfulness. I think it's also this, this radical, openness and curiosity and kindness towards ourselves and like the full breadth of the human experience and being willing to sit with ourselves in that way, just like a loyal dog or a best friend or a wonderful doting mom would do like to just hold space for ourselves is probably the biggest thing I've learned through mindfulness and EQ practices for myself. Yeah, that's such a good point. I think so often people are suppressing, repressing or numbing, and we've got lots of different numbing agents, right? Like sometimes we think of the drugs and the alcohol, but in in gambling, but there's shopping, there is scrolling on social media, there's overworking, like there's so many different ways that we numb. And 100%, Dorsey, thank you for bringing that up. Like, I just want to fully acknowledge that it can be uncomfortable to sit with your feelings. And I don't want for a second to say that when I'm feeling big feelings that I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is the most fun ever. <laughs> like I'm feeling helpless and, upset <laughs> and a little ragey. And I love this. No, <laughs> like it, it takes a lot of courage. And um, I also want to acknowledge like safety. Like I've done a lot of work over the time that I can be in my body and I can be safe and see what's going on there. And I've gotten to the other side and seen how, oh, that 60 to 90 seconds, it feels so intense in that moment, but I've felt what it's like to get to the other side after that 90 seconds. And it's like, oh, it's okay. I can do this. So I also want to acknowledge, and thank you for bringing that up, Dorsey. Like, um, I think anybody who might be hearing this and like, oh, for me, when that happens, it's super hard and thinks that, oh, these people who have gone really good at meditation and mindfulness, that it's somehow not hard for them. No, no, it does take a lot of, um, of grace to just allow yourself the humanity to be with it and then figure out different coping strategies, right? For some people that might look like shaking and moving it around other people, it might be journaling through the experience. I think that um, it's important for people listening as well to recognize there's not a one size fits all how we work through our emotions might look a little different. 100%. And thank you for sharing those, those options, right? Moving and shaking or journaling. And um, I heard you use some specific examples as to what works for you or your experiences. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's what I bring it back to is um, mindfulness gives us an opportunity to cultivate a connection to our own inner voice and become the expert on ourselves, right? Whenever I stand up in front of an audience, I'm like, I might be somewhat of an expert on the neuroscience or what mindfulness is, but you get to be the expert on you, Kristen, or whomever it is. Like, 
I don't know what anxiety looks, feels like in your body, in your mind. That's for you to figure out. And we so often go through life without coming up for air. We're just doing, doing, doing that. We don't pause to get to know ourselves better. And once we, we do, once we're the expert on ourselves, then we can take care of ourselves in the way that we need to. We can work in the way we need to. We can design our lives and be intentional with everything that's important to us with this deep self-connection and self-knowledge that is just, I mean, I can't say how much it's transformed my own life. And to watch that that light of awareness come on for my clients, is it's just such a joy to see them connect with and deeply trust themselves to navigate even the toughest of situations. Yeah. I think for everyone listening, it's a reminder that you are, you are worth it. You are worthy of it. And it's important. Like it's your birthright. Like you're here Mm -hmm. to create the time and space to get to know yourself better and what really serves you and what helps you through that. I can't tell you how often, like with a coaching client, they get to the point where they recognize like, Oh, when we're together for an hour, like that's something they've gifted themselves to actually spend that time to get to know themselves better because ultimately they're, I'm just asking questions and being the guide for them to get to their own answers. But if they don't carve out the time to ask themselves those questions and get at the answers that they don't know what those answers are. And to me, that's, um, it's, it's sad and it's such a loss. Like that's part of what you're here to do. And so I hope whenever, I hope as people are listening, um, you feel the inspiration to, to give yourself that space, to get to know yourself better in this way and understand what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, Dorsey, what would you, if you were anybody listening right now and you were going to give them an invitation around what you would like to um, see them do more of um, in order for them to be able to feel more connected to themselves, what comes up for you? I love this idea of mindful minutes and I would invite folks to, um, you you heard some suggestions today, moving, shaking, journaling, breathing, um, feeling your feet on the ground is one of my favorite ones, Um, letting your mind wander and watch where it goes, but figure out a way that you can incorporate a mindful minute into your day every day, walking the dog with your cup of tea, your coffee in the morning. I mean, again, there are a million ideas, but you're the expert on yourself. You know, what's going to work for you, but commit to giving yourself, we have 1,440 minutes in every day. And I know that there's a minute in there that you can take just for you and nurture that, um, take care of it. Just like Kristen said, commit to it for a month and, and notice what shifts after those 30 consecutive days of, of mindful minutes in a way that works for you and connects you more with yourself. Yeah. I had, I love the, I had forgotten about, I, I, I like to do that too. put my, sometimes I'll just take my socks off and then put my feet mm. on the ground. If I'm inside the office, if it's beautiful and it's outside, go on the grass. Uh, you're reminding me, I remember doing a, a keynote about six months ago and felt very inspired in that moment. I was, I was talking about that to throw my heels off and then just put my feet on the, on the ground in that moment. Cause I was like, you guys, like, this is it like ground into, and then got them all doing it and taking their shoes off and like on the ground in that moment, which was so powerful. Like we were all laughing and, but we all felt connected and they rem- they were reminded around how grounding that is to just put your feet solid into the ground and feel rooted like that. Um, such a small thing, but such a powerful thing in terms of how that can make you, especially I, I noticed for myself, those moments where I might not feel as regulated and how powerful that can be to put me back in more of a grounded state to have my feet on the ground in that way. Yeah. And it, it brings me back to the, the book Atomic Habits that you brought up already, but I believe he talks about, it's not like these giant changes that make a difference in your life. It's the little changes. And I want to highlight that message as well. Like the little shift of taking your shoes off. I mean, that takes what, five seconds, unless you're my toddler, then it takes five <laughs> minutes at least. Right. Um, but it, it's just a moment and it's like, how can you give yourself more of those moments, more of that permission to be fully yourself, to be connected to you and to be rather than do all the time. Yes. Yes. We're not, we're human beings, not human doings. Uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share to let pe- for people to get to know you a bit better in terms of 
what is, what would be one of your favorite books? But even in this context, if it's a book that's connected to what we're talking about today, that's cool, but it may be, it's something else as well. Like what has been a book that's really had a big impact on you in your life? Yeah, there are so many, like I, I just pulled up the book, why Buddhism is true, but it's a little dense. I'd say like the, the most transformational book that I've ever read and continue to listen to on audible is the alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Um, I was given that book. So, um, it's funny. I'm the, the oldest of five cousins and both me and then the older cousin in my dad's brother's family, his name's Ryan. And he, at the same time, I was thinking about quitting the corporate world to go teach mindfulness and yoga. He decided to stop the traditional, you know, get a job path and become a professional mountain biker. <laughs> so he's reading The Alchemist. We're like together over Christmas break 10 years ago. He's reading The Alchemist and he's like, you like, I'm going to give you a copy of this book. You need to read this book. And it, it sounds like you, by the way, you're nodding. I'm guessing, you wow. know, the book, but it's, it's this beautiful story about, about finding your treasure, finding your truth, following what your heart is, is inviting you to do. And it inspired me to do a lot of hard things to leave the comfortable corporate world, um, to do things like come out as being gay, to have a baby with a woman, like all these things to speak on stage when it's hard and do things like throw my shoes off. I haven't done that one yet, but like say hard truths, you know, um, deal with difficult emotions. I, I feel so much, um, support and love from that book and that message of how easy it is to get sidetracked on our way to finding our our true path but how important it is to really at the end of the day as cheesy as it sounds to follow our hearts to follow our truth and for me the only way that that happens is when i have time and silence with myself on a regular basis which is why it all starts for me with those mindful moments it's so true because when there's so much noise, you can't hear your truth. It's very hard to hear it. I love it. I think this is, I was going to ask you any final thoughts, but I think that's such a beautiful place to end. Unless there's something else that you feel really compelled that you want to add for a final thought. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> this a, a, a nice, a wonderful place to end. Um, Dorsey, where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, please go to mastermindmeditate.com. Uh, we do a lot of corporate wellness programming. We also have some programs for individuals like um, neuroscience-based stress management around the six pillars of brain health. Uh, if you're into the science, but also like it to be relatable, like there to be some storytelling, some short practices, um, a lot of stuff that we offer at Mastermind is probably going to be right up your alley. And then I'm probably most active on LinkedIn as a platform. So if you want to add me, Dorsey Standish, I'd love to connect there. And um, you'll find sh me sharing like pictures of my toddler and what he's teaching me. <laughs> I think my family is my greatest mindfulness teacher and um just love this this ability to be fully human and present for all of of what life brings ah oh, so good i will include all of that in the show notes um dorsey thank you so much for being here today yes thank you Kristen. this has been delightful and for everyone, if you enjoyed this episode, please share with others. And thanks so much for your reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And if you would like to develop more confident and emotionally intelligent leaders in your organization, let's connect. I can share more about my one-on-one -on -one coaching, transformational keynotes, and ongoing leadership training. Wherever you're listening in the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, sending tons of love. Bye-bye.